This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. The day my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive as I am taught the Word of God. My life is changed for the better and I will never be the same again. Amen. May be seated. As you're being seated, if you would, turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 5, book of Acts chapter 5. That's in the New Testament right after the Gospels. And on Sunday mornings for a while, we've been in a series entitled Miracles of the New Testament and seemed like a long time working our way through the Gospels. And now we are in the book of Acts. And today's miracle might wonder, especially for Sunday, December 31st, why deal with such a sobering passage? Well, this part of why doing the daily Bible reading throughout the year is so important that we read all of the Word of God and not just our favorite parts. And it's so important in having a balanced understanding of our faith and the Christian life but also understanding who God is, his nature, and his character. Now, as we ended the Gospels, we, spelt, we spent several weeks dealing with that part of the nature of God is to forgive. That is part of his nature. But we come to another part, characteristic of the nature of God this morning, and it's sobering. But it's one that we all need to understand. It's, all, it's one we all need to be aware of. And the reality is, as followers of Christ, we all need to live accordingly. It is the nature and it is the character of Almighty God to judge. It is the nature and it is the character of Almighty God to judge. Now, this world out here, it might call good evil, and evil good, this world out here, it might judge wrongly. You know, some of you might have been watching the game last night and been disappointed in the ref's call. That's the world. God calls things righteously, fairly, and correctly 100% of the time. And then praise God, there's grace right up until grace runs out. And praise God, there's mercy, right up until mercy comes out. And yes, yes, God, it is the nature and character of God to forgive. Yes, the Bible tells us that God is love, but he is also holy, and he is also righteous. He is the judge of the entire universe. He is a God of justice, he is a God of wrath. He is a God of judgment. And so, yes, it is his nature and character to judge. And sometimes that judgment happens now. Sometimes we see in the Word of God that judgment happens in the future. We're now in the book of Acts, and today we come to a very different kind of miracle, and it will surprise you. It is a miracle of divine judgment, yet it had positive results in the early church. In the book of Acts, we see that overwhelming generosity characterized the early church. The Bible actually tells us that there were no needy among them. Jesus said in John's gospel that as believers, we should be known by our love for one another and by our unity and that was true of the early church. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 32, says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared 
everything they had. You know, if you go to seminary, go to higher education, take a religion class, and no, it's not just at Harvard or Yale. If, you know, I took religion classes at TCU. Somebody might have you believe that in the early church they were communists. That's nonsense. Judea, Israel at the time was occupied by the Romans. They were tough, oppressive days. They were occupied by a foreign, foreign army. They were taxed brutally and unfairly. It's why tax collectors were so hated. And so it was tough. They were tough times. And in that context, the church, not just having been born again, but filled with the Holy Spirit, they were characterized by overwhelming generosity. It says, verse 32, they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. Verse 34, there were no needy persons among them. So, you know, today, 2023, it's amazing the things that people want to fight about. The fight about the tithe and 10% or to fight about giving and to fight about offerings. How pitiful when we come to the word of God and to see the generosity of the early church. Verse 34, there were no needy persons among them for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the cells, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Now again, this is why I've mentioned that daily Bible reading. The Apostle Paul would later write that a man is to work and to provide for his family. And if a man doesn't work, doesn't provide for his family, the Apostle Paul wrote that that man has in fact denied the faith, and is worse than an unbeliever. You read the book of Acts in the New Testament, you find out that two groups they were a blessing to were widows and orphans. We're to be a blessing, amen? I said we're to be a blessing, amen? And we ought to be a blessing as led by the Holy Spirit, but if someone's got their hand out and they refuse to go to work, we need to be a blessing to someone else. I said we need to be a blessing to someone else. It's all right to think critically as a Christian, as a believer. Joseph a Levite, verse 36, Joseph a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So the Bible says that from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the cells and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. We have an example, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at their feet. So overwhelming generosity characterized the early church and there were no needy among them. This Barnabas is the same Barnabas who later traveled with the apostle Paul and he sold a field and he gave 100% of the proceeds to the church. He didn't just give some. He didn't just give what was left over. He gave all. But here's an important lesson. And it's important as we begin a new year. Not everyone is a Barnabas. Not everyone is a Barnabas. You know, our son, he's so excited about basketball and he practices outside and inside and he's so excited about learning about Michael Jordan watching old games. Well, not everybody is Michael Jordan. It is just a fact of life. And in the kingdom of God, not everyone is a Barnabas. So don't lie and pretend to be someone you're not. In the parable of the talents, Jesus tells the account of a man with one talent, a man with two talents, and a man with five talents. And to bring this into our modern understanding, a talent was worth about 6,000 denarii. A denarii was what someone would be paid for a day's wages. So one talent would be the equivalent of a man's work for 16 to 20 years full time. A man with one talent, a man with two talents, and a man with five talents. And you know the parable. The man with two talents, the man with five talents, they each double what the master entrusts to them. The one talent man, though, he hides, he buries his talent, 
It doesn't even earn interest. Then when the master shows up to collect, he blames and criticizes the master. Not everyone is a two-talent man. Not everyone is a five-talent man or woman. But if you're a one-talent man or woman, or a two-talent man or woman, there's no point in lying or pretending to be something you're not, because God will judge it, and you'll reap the negative consequences in this life and in the next. What will happen to all liars? Revelation 21 verse 8 tells us, Revelation 21 verse 8, the cowardly. Do you know there will be no cowards in heaven? I know this is uh, not the popular thing in 2023, but it is the word of God. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, we live in a vile, wicked culture. The vile, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The Bible tells us that there will be no liars in the city of God. There will also be no pretenders. And we live in an age of pretense and make-believe and dress up. And what used to be considered crazy in our culture is now considered normal or sane. But just because the culture tolerates something doesn't mean God tolerates something. So the culture may tolerate fake. The culture may tolerate dress up. The culture may tolerate pretend, but that doesn't mean Almighty God does. There will be no fake Christians in the city of God. There will be no pretending Christians in the city of God. An example of this is in the parable of the wedding banquet, Matthew 22, beginning in verse 8. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So you read the parable, those that are invited, they don't come. They have every excuse in the book. Verse 9, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. That's the grace and mercy of God. Those invited don't come. They're busy. They're busy with the everyday affairs of life. So the master says, go out and invite everyone else the tax collectors, prostitutes, those looked down upon by, the religious leaders, the sinners, everyone else is invited. That is the grace and mercy of God. But still, there's no room for pretense. Verse 11, but when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. We find out in the book of Revelation that when we are born again, we are given a garment, a robe, a salvation. The book of Revelation tells us that that garment, that robe of salvation, it is white. The book of Revelation tells us that we are to keep that garment of salvation white and pure in this wicked world, unstained in this wicked world. And so we see here in verse 12, there's a man at the wedding, but he doesn't have wedding clothes. He doesn't have the garment of salvation. He's not a true believer. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. There will be no liars in the city of God but there will also be no pretenders in the city of God. And we might deceive someone in this world, but there's someone you cannot deceive. That's Almighty God. world out there is playing dress up, and some might be deceived, but God's not deceived. The Bible says God will not be deceived. He will not be mocked. So there will be no liars, in the city of God, there will be no pretenders. Not everyone is a Barnabas. So don't lie and pretend to be someone or something you're not. Now we come to Acts chapter 5. Does God judge? Yes, he does. 
Now, you might ask, Austin, is this the Lord or is this Satan? You've often heard me and my father say that John 10, 10 is the dividing line of the Bible, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So if it's stealing, killing, and destroying, that it's the enemy, it's Satan, the deceiver. You've often heard us say that God doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is remove his hand of protection from our lives, and we're automatically going to be messed up. Do we also see, though, in Scripture that there are times at which God judges and God intervenes and God brings about judgment upon the wicked? And the answer is yes. Acts 5, beginning in verse 1, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. So Barnabas, who later became an apostle, the son of encouragement, he sold a piece of property and had brought and given all of the proceeds to the church. Acts 5, verse 1, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. And I want to emphasize that. So she knew what he was up to. He wasn't keeping it in a secret. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And when I was younger, there would be times I'd hear about this or that, and I would wonder if certain couples were equally yoked together. But as I get older, I don't know if I have any gray yet, but as I get older, I realize that most couples are equally yoked together. They're of like mind and faith, like character, and sometimes they're even in cahoots together. And we want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she doesn't know, maybe he doesn't know, but more often than not, they do. So notice that it says, with his wife's full knowledge. Verse 1, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So like Cain, Ananias and Sapphira, they planned together to only give some. Like Cain, they only gave the rest. They only gave what was left over. They didn't put God first. They didn't give God their best. They were certainly no Barnabas. Unlike Barnabas, they did not give all. They were liars and pretenders because they, they came in front of everyone and they pretended that they were doing what Barnabas did. And that is giving all, when in fact it was some. Verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? See, they could have come and they said, is it what Barnabas did so wonderful? And that inspired us. But what we've decided to do is we're going to give half or we're going to give a third or we're going to give 15% or 10% or 5% or whatever it was. Had they been truthful, had they been honest, had they come in truth to the house of God, there, there would have been no problem with that. This was a free will offering. This was free will giving. But that's not what they did. That they saw what Barnabas did. Perhaps they saw how people were inspired by Barnabas or commented on what Barnabas did or or patted Barnabas on the back. They were envious. They were jealous of that. They, they wanted to present themselves like Barnabas. So they conspired together to do that. Peter said, verse 3, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied? Why don't we all say that? Say, lied. See, we, we live in a culture that doesn't want to call what something is what it is. There's such a thing as a man. There's such a thing as a woman. There's such a thing as a lie. And the world may be full of it. But as God's people, we shouldn't be full of it. When someone wants to date a daughter or son, we should be able to say, that's a Christian. Or that's not a Christian. We need to stop being confused with the spirit of this age. We need to call things what they are. And that's part of why people don't like those King James words when it comes to particular sins. 
But if, whether a child or adult, if they say something that's not true, that is a lie. And if they lie repeatedly, that makes them a liar. And where do all liars go? We're almost afraid to say it. To the lake of fire, which is the second judgment. See, it's important that we not give into, buy into, and adopt the spirit of this age. That we call things what they, they are. That something's not a lifestyle choice, but it is a sin. It is an abomination. It is a stench in the nostrils of a holy God. You might say, Austin, what does this have to do with my blessings? It has everything to do with your blessings. Because Almighty God doesn't bless sin. He doesn't bless wickedness. He doesn't bless things that are displeasing to him. Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came forward and wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Now, she didn't know what had happened to her husband, but this was her opportunity. Why don't we say, say this was her opportunity. See, even though they had decided that they were going to do this, this was her opportunity to tell the truth. This was her opportunity to speak the truth. Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You bet, great fear, great sobriety. And again, that's why we challenge you to do the Bible reading throughout the year because we need to understand who God is, his nature and his character. And yes, God is love. And yes, God forgives. And yes, God is gracious and God is merciful, but he is also a holy and righteous God. He judges with justice. And we need to live accordingly. And we might think, well, I've gotten away with this and I've gotten away with that and, and I'm gonna just keep getting away with it. There's grace upon grace right up until grace runs out. There's mercy upon mercy right up until mercy runs out. The Bible says that the Lord killeth and he maketh alive. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Long time ago, a Pentecostal minister, A. Allen, did a message entitled, God is a Killer. And in that message, he walked through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, all the examples of God striking someone down in judgment. He is a God of justice. Praise God for his grace and mercy. But justice is coming. Whether today, whether tomorrow, whether next month, next year, in eternity, justice is coming. And judgment is coming. So we have to live accordingly. These were free will offerings. Ananias and Sapphira could have given half or third or any amount, and it would have been fine if they had told the truth. But they wanted to lie and pretend that they were giving all just like Barnabas, when in fact they were just a one-talent husband and wife. What was their sin that resulted in immediate public 
judgment. They lied to God. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied to the apostles and the leadership of the church. They lied to every person that was a part of the church, every person in the assembly. They put God to the test. And what happens when you do that? This was a miracle of judgment. Instant, immediate judgment. But there were good results after. Look at verse 12. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. All the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. You want to be a part of that group? I'm not so sure. I heard someone died last week. See, we live in a time of perversion and lie upon lie upon lie upon lie, and we almost get immune to it and forget who's in charge of the universe. A day of reckoning is coming. We better live accordingly. Nevertheless, more and more women were believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. So they gather for church. A husband and wife, they pretend to be like Barnabas. They, they lie. They drop dead. You would think that'd be it. The doors would close. No one would ever come back. But they had growth. They had revival. They had people being added under their number. They had wonderful miracles of healing. Sometimes the spiritual house needs to be swept clean. In the house of God and in our own lives. The Apostle Peter would later write in 1 Peter 4, 17, that judgment begins in the house of God. You know, there have been times I've been around young ministers my age, and I'll, I'll mention certain names like Leonard Ravenhill or David Wilkerson, and they kind of react like Emily when you put the veggies in front of her. They don't want to hear those names. Why? Because they were men that understood the holiness and the righteousness and the judgment and the wrath of Almighty God. But it's not the Old Testament that says this, it's the New Testament, that it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 12 and verse 6 says, the Lord disciplines those he loves. We all know Hebrews 11, the faith hall of fame, but Hebrews 12 tells us that proof that we're part of the family is that God corrects us, that he disciplines us, that he doesn't just tell us what we want to hear. He tells us where we're wrong. He tells us when we need to change. He tells us when we need to do better, when we need to repent. He disciplines those he loves. And you might say, well, the Lord don't discipline me. Well, you need to get saved because you're not a part of the family. The Lord disciplines those he loves. Last Sunday in Christmas communion, I brought you to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31, that if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. If we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. You might, might say, Austin, what I do, how I live, my decisions, they have nothing to do with what I experience in life. Nonsense! We saw last Sunday in 1 Corinthians 11 that Paul told the church at Corinth, which was out of control, that because they had mistreated one another, and they had not received from the Lord's table with reverence and respect that there were those in their midst that were weak and sickly and had died prematurely. How we live matters. What we do matters. Whether we are truth tellers or liars, it matters. Discipline is for our good, and it is far better to judge ourselves and to continually make positive course corrections. Sometimes the spiritual house has to be swept clean. The church, the ecclesia, any gathering of believers, it is a living entity. There are sheep and goats, the mature and the immature. There are occasionally wolves that have to be dealt with. Just a few months ago, my sweet mother, sweet Pastor Sue, she caught someone coming into church on a Sunday morning and told them to never come back. Why? 
because we feed the sheep of God. We protect the sheep of God. And when someone demonstrates themselves to be a wolf, we say, not here, not this pasture. There are wheat and tares or weeds. And every living thing occasionally needs a bowel movement. And no, I don't mean to be gross on a Sunday morning. But you, we, you all know, not feeling so great, there's a bowel movement, and then you feel better. Every living thing needs a bowel movement. And the church of Almighty God, it is a living thing. And so that's what happened in Acts 5. It was horrific. The Bible says they were seized by great fear. But then the church grew and miracles took place and many were added to their number. Not everyone is a Barnabas. So don't lie and pretend to be something or someone you're not. Handle money rightly. Don't lie about money. The Bible says that everything that is in darkness will be brought into the light. It's going to happen. Whether it's tomorrow or next month or next year, sooner or later it will be brought into the light. Jesus said there's a day coming when we will have to give an account for every deed and every word spoken in the body. There's this belief out there that, well, grace means I just do whatever I want and I'm good. No, there's coming a day when we will have to give an account. So live accordingly. They could have given half or a third or any amount and it would have been fine if they, have, they had told the truth. I've heard my father rehearse what Lester Summerall taught him, that if a man or woman's not right with their money, they're not right. How we handle money reveals what's really in the heart. That's why Jesus taught in Matthew 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Barnabas' treasure was in the work of God. That's why Jesus taught in the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, verse 29. Everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. Remember in Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler. Jesus told him he lacked one thing, which was treasure in heaven. Mark 10, verse 21, go. Jesus told him, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me. And we know the account. That young man, he could not bring himself to do what Jesus said do. He lacked the faith to obey. And had he obeyed, what would have been the harvest? The Bible says in verse 22, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Yet that rich man, he was no Barnabas. Yet that rich man, young man, he did not lie. He did not pretend to be something he wasn't. Not everyone is a two-talent or a five-talent man. Not everyone is a Barnabas. But don't lie and pretend to be someone or something you're not. Handle money rightly. Don't lie about money. There have been times, and you know, typically this just comes up if someone's volunteering, but you know, it becomes a pattern where the office knows office notices that they don't give or don't give at all. And sometimes this has come up with young people, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So Aaron will say, hey, you, know, you can't, can't volunteer, you can't be on stage if you don't give, it's not right. Because again, what did Jesus teach? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We've had young men say all kinds of things. One young man in his 20s said that his mother did his giving for him. Young ladies, run. Run from that, run from that situation. So we can, we can fool each other. You might be able to fool someone you're dating, but we can't fool Almighty God. We are to be truth tellers. We are to operate in truth and righteousness. And our Heavenly Father cannot entrust more to us if we're dishonest about what we have currently been entrusted with. Once there was a situation, long time ago, you'll not know who this is about. There was a husband and he would give his wife cash to give. Well, what she was doing was she was taking that cash to shop with and she would give a little bit and spend the rest. 
And I, I don't know how her husband didn't figure this out if, unless she was just good at hiding all the shopping bags. But she was doing this over the course of a year. Well, it became an issue when the church sent out giving statements. And the husband was expecting one number. He didn't see the number he was expecting. What's going on? Well, he found out that his wife was taking the money he was giving her to give, and she was spending it. She was shopping with it. God can't bless that. God can't bless that. God can't bless cheating people. God can't bless taking advantage of people. God can't bless, you know, there's nothing wrong with the prophet, but if you're ripping someone off or taking advantage of someone, God can't bless that. So if you want God to entrust you with more, you got to handle money rightly. And if you want God to entrust you with more in 2024, you've got to handle money rightly. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 29, everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. Pastor has challenged us all to believe God for a doubling in 2024, but how can we believe God for a doubling if we don't handle money rightly right now? How can we believe God for a doubling if we lie about this and we lie about that and we lie about money? How can we believe God for a doubling in 2024 if we are fakes and pretenders? I know it's easy to look at this or that in the world, but again, I would remind you of the Sermon on the Mount. How can we look at the speck of dust in someone else's eye when there is a problem that has to be dealt with in our own lives? Handle what is in your life rightly, and God will entrust more to you. Handle money rightly, and God will entrust more to you. Handle money rightly in 2024, and God will entrust more more to you. Matthew 25, 29, everyone who has will be given more. See, Barnabas, you think Barnabas went backwards? He was still breathing. He didn't go backwards. Ananias and Sapphira thought they were doing something. They thought they were coming out ahead. They thought they were getting away with something. They, they thought they were doing this or that, but it didn't matter because they were dead. And this life, whether long, whether short, it is temporary. And someone may get away with something today or tomorrow, but there's coming a moment when this life will come to an end and each of us will step into eternity and into instant judgment. To be, set, to be with the Lord or to be forever separated from God. So how we live and what we do and what we say, it all matters. Please bow your heads. You might be here today and perhaps you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never asked him to be the Lord and the savior of your life. He said, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. This world that we live in, it'll tell you that there are many ways to God, that there are many paths to lie. This world that we live in, it'll tell you that if you are good enough, that's sufficient, that you'll be in heaven someday. Friends, that's a lie. The Bible says that we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That means each and every one of us is in need of a savior. His name is Jesus. The good news is, as he said, that any of us can call upon him and be saved. What better day than today to call upon him and to give him your life and to become a part of the family of God? If you're here today and say, Austin, that's me. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I want to ask him to be the Lord, to be the savior of my life. If that's you, wherever you're seated, raise your hand where I'll see it and I'll know. If you want me to pray and say, Austin, pray with me. I want to ask Jesus into my heart and into my life. I want him to be my Lord and to my Savior. You might also be here today and at a time in your life, you prayed a prayer, you walked an aisle, but you know in your heart, you're not right with God. You've been doing your own thing, perhaps. You have done things that you have gotten away with. Maybe no one knows about. Maybe a husband or wife doesn't know about. Friend, the Lord knows. 
The Bible says that he who conceals his sins doesn't prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them, that means turns away from them, they find mercy. The Bible says the mercies of God are new every morning. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're here today and say, Austin, that, that's me, pray with me. I want to recommit my life. I want to make things right with the Lord today. If that's you, wherever you're seated, raise your hand to where I'll see it and I'll know if you want me to pray with you. For the sake of those that raise their hands, we're going to pray. I'd like to ask you to come join me at the front. If you brought a Bible or purse or anything with you, bring it with you. That way you're not concerned about it. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you say, Austin, this is for me. Come join me at the front. We're going to pray. We're for you. The Lord, he is good and he is gracious and he is wonderful. Well, let's pray. Repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I repent of my sins. And I ask Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Set me free of anything that would hinder me in living for you. I thank you for making me a part of your family. I thank you for filling me with your spirit. I thank you for a new beginning and a fresh start in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. To so take just a moment and go with Mr. Jeff Hughes. He's got some things to be a blessing to you. Praise God for his grace and his mercy. I said praise God for his grace and his mercy. And I know we think, man, that must have been a wild church service back there in Acts 5. That's not anything to want or desire, amen. It's not anything to want or desire. But it needs to be a reminder in our lives that what we do, it matters. How we live matters. And better in our lives to change, to repent, to take corrective action than for something to be brought in darkness out into the light or better or to face a situation where we run out of time and step into immediate judgment and there's no more time to make it right or to do different. I've often used my father-in-law, Scott, as an illustration. He faced a challenge in his body a few years ago and faced the fight of his life in his stomach area. Many, many weeks, I believe more than 30 weeks, was in ICU. He's a walking, talking miracle that he is still with us. But I remember when he came out of all of that and came off all the drugs they had him on, he had no idea what was going on while he was walking through that. It was his wife, Carolyn and Jessica and others fighting the fight of faith on his behalf. He woke up, I remember telling me, him telling me about how when he was out and all the drugs he was on, he thought he was in a spy movie, movie being chased by Russians. The whole idea that we can just live however we want, do whatever we want, treat people however we want, and then there'll, there'll be a day where maybe we're in the hospital and you know we can give a loved one a list and say, well, let these 55 people know that now's the time they can come see me and I'm gonna ask their forgiveness and I'm gonna make situations right and call the preacher, call the preacher. I wanna pray, I'm ready to pray. See, we'd like to believe that that's the way it's going to work out. I'm telling you, there's no guarantee of that. What the Bible says is true. Here today, gone tomorrow. Like a flower of the field. Here today, gone tomorrow. So that's why you got to live right today. Got to make the most of today. Praise God for the time we have. Praise God for our years being multiplied. But we have to live ready. We have to live ready. We have to live ready. Amen. I hope the message was a blessing and encouragement to you.